Hey everyone, I am Corey Lee, the content manager here at Hondiscover. And thank you so much for joining us for a brand new episode of Access All Areas. Today, I'm gonna to be talking with a very special guest. I'm gonna be talking with Josh Winterskill. He is the founder of Able Move, which is a phenomenal company that we'll delve more into in just a minute. He'll tell us all about it. We'll talk about some of his exciting travels around the world what the company is doing and how the travel industry in general could be better for wheelchair users. So let's bring on Josh. Hey Josh, thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, hey everyone, yeah. uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Corey. Nice to uh, finally have the opportunity to chat with you, uh, with everyone on board. Yeah, it's so good to talk with you today and I'm excited to like talk all about traveling and the travel industry and what all that entails you know as someone with a disability uh, but first can you please tell us briefly about yourself and about your company able move sure um so i'm 28 or turning 28 uh, in the next couple of weeks uh i've got spinal muscular atrophy type three uh, i've been in uh, a powered chair now since i was about the age of 10 so me and corey have kind of that condition uh in in uh you know together i suppose um i've kind of been to uni college and done all of that sort of stuff and i think as i've got older um traveling has become you know more common um and i've my, i've been very fortunate where my nan kind of brought me up and took me traveling a lot as a child uh, and with as you grow older, you get stronger, uh, sorry, weaker, uh, but with this condition and it makes, you know, air travel particularly challenging. And through my, you know, experiences of uh, getting older and the deterioration, um, decided to set up my own company, Able Move. We've been going now for three years. Uh, we kind of specialize in products to help wheelchair users uh, trans originally was to transfer on and off aircraft. And over the last sort of 15 months with COVID, we've started branching out slightly to create a more wider range of products that could be useful in other settings other than just aviation. And it's kind of come from lived experience and, you know, getting uh, feedback from the community in terms of their problems traveling also. So, you know, this is very much just, you know, very early days uh, for us and exciting times, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. And uh, when you talk about Able Move, like what inspired you to start the company and when did you start it? Oh, that's a very good question. So, so my, my route to entrepreneurship was slightly bizarre. So I was actually in Tenerife at the time. Uh, and for those who haven't been to Tenerife, uh, it's probably one of my favorite accessible destinations I've, I've ever been to. Um, and I was I was sat by the pool drinking a bottle of beer as you do on holiday, reading a book called uh, Start with the Why by Simon Sinek. Uh, and for those who have never read it, I kind of highly encourage people to read it. It kind of gets you thinking about you know your motivations and why we do things in life. Um, and it really kind of helped give me a bit more clarity in terms of you know what it what actually kind of motivates me to get up in the morning. And I think sometimes days when you've got a, a disability can be quite challenging and so having something to really focus on that you're really passionate about um, just makes that kind of day-to-day -day stuff a little bit easier um, and yeah so I was reading the book and it got me thinking about my job that I was doing at the time which was cyber security and I just thought actually wouldn't it be kind of really nice based on the experiences that I've had traveling to create a solution that would have a real world impact I think often you get stuck in kind of a job um, that may not be externally facing, that you don't actually have any output that you can see. And when you're designing something that is improving people's life and opening kind of new possibilities, which is what, uh, you know, our tagline is, I think there's just, the, the, it just changes your mindset completely. So yeah, it was drinking a pint or drinking some beer uh, by a pool in the sun, reading a book. Awesome. And uh, currently what all products does able move offer i know you know i know them but can you tend to tell everyone watching what all products are currently available yeah i mean it's you know there's there's lots of products out there on the market and you know they they all do fantastic things and i think it's important to understand that you know 
the the idea behind the products is to get people traveling really and living kind of more independent lifestyles so to speak and so we basically provide two transfer slings one is a more expensive version which comes with kind of hoist straps and compartments for wheelchair cushions uh, and the idea is that, you know, when you're traveling, particularly by air, getting onto aisle chairs is particularly uncomfortable. You know, sitting on an aircraft seat can be very uncomfortable. And a lot of pe people tend to use their wheelchair cushions. And, you know, that time from when you're being lifted from your chair onto an aisle chair, th there's no comfort or support on those seats. And it got me thinking, how can we make sure that somebody perhaps could travel with their own wheelchair cushion? inside the product so when they're being lifted from their chair into the aisle chair you're actually getting that pressure relief and support which is something that nobody you know really gets at this moment in time so it was to improve the comfort of being on an aisle chair and then obviously give you the pressure relief with your cushion inside the sling whilst you're on the aircraft so it's just to make that transition from your wheelchair to the aircraft seat much much more easier and more dignified and comfortable Exactly. Yeah, I uh, got the sling a couple of years ago and have used it ever since. I mean, it's really been a game changer for me. Uh, I've been able to, you know, get in the airplane seat easier and be lifted with the sling. So it's made that process a hundred times better. And then even I recently got in the gyrocopter um, and was able to fly to the beaches and use the sling to get inside the gyrocopter. So I mean, it's really opened up the world for me and for other wheelchair users as well, I'm sure. I mean, I know that um, I've tried quite a few different types of slings on the market, and this one is by far the best. So I'm not just saying that. I mean, it, it really is a phenomenal product that you guys have made. And I love that, you know, you saw the need for a product to make air travel better because we know as wheelchair users that air travel is tremendously difficult at times and even just transferring onto the aircraft is quite a challenge so um with that said what keeps you inspired to keep traveling the world oh gosh i mean you know there's there's so much that keeps me inspired to travel the world. i'm i quite to like to learn different cultures and you know you get kind of absorbed in your own little bubble and actually learning about other cultures you know, having that independence to travel, have that freedom of choice um, really kind of gets me going. And I've never been to New Zealand uh, and my mum's family live out, or half of my mum's family, or pretty much all of my mum's family actually live over there. And I've never had the opportunity to fly to New Zealand um, because of, you know, the duration of the flight, right? And yeah. they do do stopovers. And whilst that's great, you know, you're still looking at a 13 hour flight and actually, even with our product that can still make the flight challenging because of the toileting and stuff like that. But we'll probably touch more on that later. Um, but effectively, you know, there's so many places that I'd like to explore. Um, I definitely want to go to South Africa at some point, definitely want to visit Japan, um, especially I'm really keen to see how Tokyo plans out and, you know, what they've done for the Paralympic Games. Uh, you know, Japan is so well advanced when it comes to technology and as we all know, you know, yeah. that has a huge benefit for folk like us. And so I'd, I'd really like to get over to Asia at some point. That would be really cool. Um, and maybe Dubai. Um, that look, I, I've seen a lot of people have very good experiences in Dubai. Uh, and so very keen to get over there as well. So, yeah, I, I just think it's understanding different cultures. And I think the bit that motivates me more is not what I do. It's actually encouraging other people to travel. Pretty much what you do. I think there's this kind of sense of, satisfaction that you get when you see other people exploring it more so than you experiencing it yourself yeah i think you're exactly right i mean that's kind of what keeps me traveling constantly and i've not been to dubai or tokyo so whenever you're ready i'm like ready to go <laughs> with you we can meet there um those are two of my top like dream destinations <laughs> yeah i mean i'm sure we could definitely sort that out um absolutely corey and i think the you know aside from the 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 original product that we that we started with which a lot of you will know was the easy travel seat um yeah. we've also branched out to another variant of the product which comes with a head support um that is much thinner and it's much much more pliable for people that have got molded seats that have to have different types of cushioning on board an aircraft for posture and things like that 
Uh, it can also be used for a whole range of other activities. So it's really good for swimming because there's less material. So if you've got a hot tub, you've got a pool, you might want to go to the beach for a day. Uh, the, our light version is, a, again, another fantastic option that people can have um, if it's something that they want to do kind of water based. The other the other thing that I try to encourage people, and this is kind of not just our slings, but just slings in general, is that people when they're traveling should kind of have a sling under them at all times, um, yeah. because you just never know when an emergency might happen where you need to be lifted out of your chair you could be in a hotel or you could be in a high-rise building or, or a, you know a service station and for some reason the lift breaks what do you do um and so i kind of try to encourage people to kind of travel with slings under them you know generally as well uh, but you know in and around the home there's kind of no need for it yeah. so that's that's the other product we provide and then we've got a whole range of other uh products as well what i what i've what was really cool was um, we've got this product called Able Dry, which for many people, it, they'll resonate with this. So if you go kind of swimming or you get out of the beach, you kind of put a towel over your chair to keep your cushion dry. And how many times have you then removed the towel only to find that your cushion is damp and you're on holiday and you've got out the pool, you've gone to the room <laughs> and then you're thinking, oh my God, I've just got to put my cushion out on the on the deck to dry um because it's damp and then only to find that it's still damp if you're going out in the evening and what we did was we thought okay well look let's kind of create a cover that is cut out into the shape that will cover the majority of wheelchairs that actually ensures that the seating area basically remains dry the whole time so you know if you're getting in and out of the pool all day this is something that you could just sit in uh, and it will keep your chair completely dry uh, and this was kind of stemmed from my nan a lot of people who know me um, my nan is kind of probably, you know, like your mum, so to speak, you know, she's there with you all the time and, you know, she guides you and, you know, gives you the inspiration and stuff. And nan was the one that actually kind of designed this product for me, uh, in the fact that we used kind of a, a blanket that was much bigger, not really cut out to shape and it did the job, but it, you know, it was, it was kind of cheap, a bit tacky. Um, and we just wanted something that kind of you know, was good quality, that fit nice, that looked good as well. You know, there's this focus on, you know, the way in which we look as society as a whole now. And I think as young people making our mark in the world, we want to feel confident in doing that. And actually being and using a product that you feel confident in is really, really important. And it is for me. And I try to show that in the products that we provide. Yeah. We also have, I mean, I could go on, but we've, we've, we've got a harness as well. And this is really important. So what we've identified is when you're traveling in countries that may aren't that may not be so good when it comes to moving and handling um often if you've got very poor upper body control like me and probably like yourself Corey, yeah. often if you if you fall forward there's kind of you get to a point where there's no return and you end up you know falling all the way forward or to the mm -hmm. side and through feedback from customers we what we designed was a strap and a harness that people could use that could be put around the, the the slings that we have as an added layer of safety, just in case, you know, you have one of those, you know, bad, you know, members of staff that don't lift properly or not strong enough. And it's just giving you that extra bit of safety as a traveler um, to be reassured that, you know, you've got that, that added bit of safety for you. Um, and then finally, we've also created our own version of leg straps. Now, you know, that's not new to the to wheelchair users, um, but we just thought it was a, a nice accompaniment to what it is that we provide. So often, you know, you, I see people going down an aisle chair on an aircraft and you see, you know, you see staff holding people's legs together oh, yeah. mm -hmm. as well as pushing the aisle through the aircraft. And we now live in a COVID world where we want to kind of move that physical interaction and hands on approach. And so if you've got your own leg strap, you can put it around your legs before you get onto the aisle chair and it will keep your legs in position. And the thing is with aisle chairs, you know, there's just no standard and consistency to them. Often some will have head supports, others won't. Some will have straps, some will won't. And it's just hit and miss. So I think the more that we can give to passengers now to give them more confidence and safety, you know, to know that no matter where they are in the world, they have a safe and appropriate means of being lifted on and off an aircraft, especially when airports and that don't have their own equipment yeah exactly i mean I, every time that i fly to a new airport or a new country it's always a debacle with you know what's that aisle chair going to be like or is it going to 
be able to, you know, hold me up. And I mean, I have poor upper body control um, due to SMA also, just like you have. So um, it's really difficult to be sort of hanging up right if there aren't like armrests on the side of the chair or um, all kinds of different things. So um, it's yeah, always what I think what frustrates me with the aisle chairs is they're designed to fit the aircraft. They're not designed to fit right. us, you know, yeah. and there's so many people out there that just physically cannot sit in an aisle chair and they either have the choice of not traveling at all, which is clearly not a choice, or yeah. they have to be lifted right the way from the air bridge or the ambi lift down through an aisle into the seat. And it's just not on. And, you know, we'll touch later on kind of wheelchair in the cabin and we all know that's the right solution and it's coming. But, you know, there's stuff that we can do in the meantime to try and improve the standard of our chairs and how we get on and off an aircraft. Yeah, I would love to go ahead and just delve into air travel if we can. So what challenges oh, have you... You're warming me up. <laughs> <laughs> what challenges have you personally had like when it comes to air travel and how do you think that the air travel industry can improve? Uh, I I, don't, I, think I don't even know where to start, Corey. I mean, I've, I know I had, I've got the question. Sorry, a bit of a, a bit of a glitch there with the Wi-Fi. Um, I mean, I don't know where to start. I think if we kind of break it down a little bit and we look at kind of this process of having to provide information, right? So you you might in America, um, you're probably you know there's 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 quite a few, there's a few airlines, but obviously there's some predominant ones that you will probably fly with you know, more frequently, whereas within Europe, we have a whole range of different routes and airlines and actually providing information, um, providing information before you travel with every airline can be a real pain in the backside. And it's not until you then arrive at the airport, you're then asked to provide all of this information again. And you're like, oh my God, this is just so frustrating. Why can't the airlines just pass all of this information on or actually capture more information that can then be passed on to the staff at the airports to make sure that we're getting the assistance that it is that we've said we need. Um, and often that isn't happening. And we we find that throughout the journey, we're providing information all the time. And so for me, I really want to see the industry um, move forward and improve by reducing the amount of times we have to provide information. I think that would make the kind of that seamless journey, uh, seamless experience for us much, much better. Um, also, I think there's this huge anxiety, I know I do, with busy environments and airports. Um, and there's nothing worse sitting at a, a boarding gate, seeing people queuing up to board, and you're kind of sat there thinking, oh my God, where's special assistance? I mean, they're boarding and I should be boarding now because I want, you know, I want to board first because, I don't, you know, there's nothing worse than being boarded when people are walking on the aircraft. So I get I get really anxious. My chest starts going tight. I start getting angry. And wouldn't it just be really, really nice to be able to communicate directly live with somebody in the airport that says that you can say, I'm here, where's the stuff? And they can just tell you someone's on their way. It's this kind of reassurance as a passenger to know that you're being looked after and you're not just left stranded because that's kind of the feeling we get, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know, have you had any experiences like that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, every time that I fly almost, it's always, you know, something is going to go wrong. I feel like every time I fly. So whether that means, you know, not being the first to board or, you know, waiting for an hour after we land to get my wheelchair back or the wheelchair going to baggage claim instead of to the gate or I mean, it's always something. So I definitely agree that the process should be a lot smoother and there should be you know guidelines that are there are currently guidelines actually here in the u.s so with the air carrier access act but they are not really followed all of the time and a lot of people don't understand or even know about those guidelines that work in the airport and for the airlines so often i find that like when i'm in the airport i'm having to tell them about the acaa guidelines and regulations that they should be following. And that should definitely not be the case. I mean, they should already know about that and be adhering to it, but um, we're just not at that level yet. Well, I think we're gonna get there. I think it's just a matter of time. And I think we are 
we are seeing improvements and I think we'll touch base on that towards the end. Um, but no, I, I definitely resonate with you there. And there, there's some other points as well. So, you know, things like emergency evacuations. Um, emergency evacuations is something that is just, it's there, but nobody really thinks about it. And I think we've had this conversation uh, potentially, or I know I've had it with somebody or quite a lot of people actually, that depending on where you are, so for instance, if you're in America, it's a requirement that the airlines provide you an individual emergency briefing. Yeah. Now, we don't really have that in Europe and I've never, ever, ever received anything like that. And actually a lot of us passengers that aren't able to transfer independently, we have to fly with somebody else. And so there's this requirement that you then have to fly with somebody to help you off in an emergency. But the amount of times I see people that don't travel with a sling under them for the flight. So if you do need to be taken off in an emergency, you've got a, an appropriate means or a fighting chance of getting off that aircraft in one piece. And the frustrating thing is, is that we we just assume that if an aircraft's going down, um, there's going to be no hope. But actually, in a lot of cases, there are. Um, and I just think that the airlines have a responsibility to be raising awareness around the emergency and the safety of these passengers, especially as, as the industry is so heavily regulated around safety. And yet they seem to kind of let this one slip through the net. Um, and I just for me, it's if, if I'm a passenger that can't transfer, I would be really heavily thinking about how would I actually get off in an emergency? And the more you think about it, the more it kind of makes you think, actually, perhaps maybe I do need to travel with something that can help me evacuate. Mm -hmm. um, the other things, I mean, there's loads. I, I mean, the amount of times we've been sat on board waiting for special assistance mm -hmm. um, to come and get us, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, an hour, you know, 40 minutes to an hour to just get off an aircraft. Uh, things like broken chairs. I mean, it's just it's just crazy how many issues there are. I think one of the interesting ones that always get gets me though is security and the inconsistencies of security. So yeah. when I was in the Caribbean last year, I was actually asked by somebody in security to stand up out of my wheelchair because wow. they wanted to check my cushion um, for security reasons. Now I've never ever seen my father go so red in his face so quickly. I mean. How can you just look at someone in a wheelchair and assume that they can just stand up or be you know, lifted out of their chair so they could check their cushion? I mean, we could have done it, but the point was is that that should never really be asked. I think it's just so wrong. Um, and I've had, I've had people ask me to take my shoes off before. Um, I've had somebody literally just run their hands over me to my wheelchair getting a full inspection. And I suppose what I'm trying to say is that this, there's no consistency when it comes to security and how they handle people with uh, disabilities. And I'm not just talking wheelchairs, I'm talking hidden disabilities, uh, you know, people that kind of have cognitive um, or sensory um, impairments. Actually, we need to be doing more in, in kind of having separate channels for those, you know, for individuals to go through to give them a, a more appropriate environment. Yeah. Um, also, I mean, we could talk about lack of accessible toilets. So. You know, we're seeing a rapid increase in changing places toilets here in the UK um, and we are seeing more being rolled out in the US, but not fast enough. Uh, and these toilets have a massive impact on people's ability to travel, especially for those that can't access a toilet on board an aircraft. You know, if you've got a long drive to an airport, um, you know, you might need to go to the toilet at the airport before you board. And if there's no changing places toilet, you kind of, well, what do I do now? Because I'm already having to deprive myself of not going on, to, uh, you know, to a toilet on board the aircraft. So I yep. suppose for us, there's still a lot of advocating to be done on toilets. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are, Corey, how the US is progressing on that. Yeah, I completely agree with everything you've said. Um, in the US, there is definitely a lack of accessible restrooms um, and airports. I mean, I think I've only seen like an adult size changing table, maybe twice in the US um, in airports. So they are not, I mean, frequent, they're not in every airport like they should be. It's very hard to find one. And um, that's a huge challenge. I mean, no doubt about it. That's one of the biggest challenges is being able to use the restroom before, during, and you know after a flight upon landing. Um, and so it's a huge challenge and I'm often just like dehydrating myself, starving myself um, before a flight so that I won't need to use the restroom. 
And that's kind of the part of traveling that I dread the most. And it's the most challenging by far, I think. And um, for, for most wheelchair users, I think that is, I mean, that's the comment that I receive the most is always about air travel and using the restroom. So I think that's an area that desperately needs to improve quickly. I, I mean, I've got some something really interesting. So we, we did a survey a while back, which you kindly shared with the community and it gave us some really valuable insight. And actually what was really interesting that was for, if people could remain within their wheelchair on board the aircraft, but could not access the on you know the toilet on board for a short haul flight wow. over seven i think it was around about 70 to 75 percent would fly but when you're talking long haul even if people were sat in their wheelchair for a long haul flight yeah. actually only 40 percent of people would consider flying long haul so actually you know the industry has a duty to look at accessible toilets and what do we actually mean by accessible toilet? Well, we mean changing places because it has a, a you know, a, a, a bed that somebody could lie down and turn over and, you know, there's a hoist and there's a toilet, et cetera. And I suppose the question we, we, we're finding now, not a question, but what we're seeing the industry doing at the moment, particularly for sustainability reasons, um, their aircraft are becoming more fuel efficient. They're trying to reduce the amount of weight that's on an aircraft so that actually that they can fly from the UK to the US, for example, on a single aisled aircraft. And as we know, what does that mean? It means less space and less space means less likely of a proper accessible toilet. And of course, you know, t accessible toilet can be, you know, mean various different things to various different people and their circumstances. But to make something truly accessible, we do need a style of changing places toilet on board an aircraft to get, you know, to be true, truly inclusive and get everybody to have the right to access the toilet. Um, we really need to be advocating for that. But my concern is, is that the, the sustainability of aviation becoming more green, it is putting a threat on accessibility from a toilet perspective. Um, yeah. So it concerns me, but it's something that I'm definitely still trying to push very much so because it's such a big impact for people. Yeah, that's a good point that you made about the more green that it's becoming, the less accessible. So I think that's something that's often like skipped over and people don't really think about. So I'm really glad that you're addressing that now. Yeah, I, I you know, I there's there's lots of people that share stuff and we've seen airlines trying to design more accessible toilets for single art aircraft. And whilst they're great and they do make it more accessible for for many more people, those that really need the support just will never be able to access them. Um, and it's really frustrating when you're seeing loads of um, hotspots around the world trying to become more accessible to yeah. increase tourism for people with disabilities and making their venues fully accessible to then realize, well, actually, you know, my, my, my customers may not be able to come to my hotel because he can't go to the toilet on an aircraft. <laughs> and yeah. so there's these things that we're going to talk about towards the end around what can we do in terms of an industry to collaborate. Uh, but yeah, toileting is definitely a, a major issue and it's becoming an increasingly hidden problem that people don't know about. Yeah, and I want to give a quick shout out to some of the people that are watching. If you are watching us, feel free to leave a comment or a question in the comments and we'll definitely try to answer. But um, Auntie says, greetings from Finland. Uh, so Finland is one of my favorite countries. So thank you so much for watching us. And Natalie, nice auntie. <laughs> yeah, Natalie also agrees that access to plane toilets are a big problem for us who walk with crutches also. Um, so yeah, access to plane toilets are a huge issue and probably the leading issue, I think, when it comes to travel as a wheelchair user. Um, definitely one of the biggest struggles. And, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, what's wrong with airlines, like how they can improve, but are there any basic tips that you can give, um, you know, for someone that maybe uses a wheelchair and is thinking about flying for the first time, are there any quick, easy tips that you could give to help them out? Yeah, I mean, definitely from a chair perspective, I would be obviously, you know, taking notes about all of the, the weight, the height, the length, um, and any kind of removable parts that you may want to protect. Um, some people choose to take those parts off the wheelchair, such as kind of the joystick area, because if that breaks, you're screwed. If a footplate breaks, you can kind of 
maybe get away without it but you can't get away without your joystick um, so you know there's different parts that you might want to take off the chair and take on board often what a lot of people are doing is actually attaching kind of some instructions onto the back of the chair in terms of how to disengage it so that you know the staff can push it without forcing it you know identifying specific lifting points all of these things are really helpful to the airlines um uh so i would i kind of encourage people to do as much as they can to have this information ready and easily available and attach it to your chair i think the real challenge here is particularly kind of on uh low cost carriers where you've got 20 30 minute turnaround times that boarding process is so goddamn intense that trying to dismantle an electric chair and get it ready so it's kind of wrapped up and secure in flight mode ready to go into the hold I mean, it's bloody stressful oh, yeah. um, and it, it, I mean, it shouldn't be like that. And I think there's kind of, yeah, I, I, I think those are my, I think that's one of my first tips. I think the other tip uh, for kind of wheelchair users as well would be to um, identify, you know, the airport in which you're flying to, what assistance do you require? And, you know, again, look at the toileting um, features that those airports have. Mm -hmm. um definitely think about how you're going to get on and off an aircraft uh we'd obviously recommend having your own transferring sling but for those that kind of are really paranoid about being lifted uh there are some fantastic uh businesses out there so uh you've got things like the eagle hoist and uh you've got the provalis and you know there are airports around the world that you can book those um to help get you on and off an aircraft um but again there's there's caveats to those but they are very useful for people should you wish to use them so i think those are when it comes to flying those bits i think are very important to remember or think about yeah absolutely and i think you know that the world it is improving in regards to accessibility i think you know every year we are seeing some improvements whether that means you know companies like able move coming out with new products that help wheelchair users or companies like and discover, you know, launching with accessible accommodations around the world. So I do think that the world is getting more accessible, but um, there's still definitely a lot of room to improve. But I would love to hear if you think as well that accessibility is improving and what would you love to still see be improved? If you could only maybe pick two things that you would like to see be improved, what would those be? Jesus Christ, you've put me on the spot here. Um, I, I think firstly, just kind of accessibility as a whole. I think it's kind of covered in inverted commas under inclusion. And certainly in the West, we're seeing, uh, you probably heard of the Valuable 500, um, a load of organizations making pledges and commitments to um, you know, make kind of their businesses and society more inclusive. And what we've seen is we've seen a lot of hotel brands, a lot of airlines, that have signed up to these pledges to improve um, diversity and inclusion and accessibility. And I think there are huge advancements that we're gonna see over the next you know, five to 10 years. Whilst there has already been huge amounts of improvement, we are still way, way behind in terms of where we need to be to be truly inclusive. Um, and I think the Valuable 500 is a very good start into making kind of these changes happen um, in society as a whole. I think for me, when it comes to accessibility and travel, I think we need consistency. Um, I think consistency, trust, um, and it needs to be enjoyable. So we need to, as a community, we rely on having consistency because consistency builds confidence. We know that we're going to travel somewhere that's gonna be accessible, that's gonna have the right support. I can get involved in amenities. I can enjoy my holiday like everybody else. And that's what we need. So we need to be encouraging travel and tourism around consistency on accessibility. And that can mean a whole host of different things, uh, which I'll talk about um, in a moment. Um, and I think the other bit is, again, trust. I think for us, if we have a bad experience, that can often make us not want to travel again. And if you've got very specific personal circumstances that you know, one bad experience can put you off traveling for life. The travel industry doesn't want you to not travel. I mean, that's just bad. It doesn't make good business sense either. And so there's a, that, you know, they've got this interest um, to value us and value the money that we bring um, to the industry. 
Um, so I think consistency and trust are huge. And I think what we need to see, Corey, is we need to see this kind of pan travel and tourism approach from a global perspective that focuses on driving this kind of consistency, trust and accountability to the industry as a whole on improving accessibility. So I, I hope that kind of in part answers some of your question. Yeah, definitely. And I, um, you know, often when wheelchairs are damaged or during a flight or something goes wrong, people are immediately wanting to boycott and like not fly anymore, what you were just talking about. But I think the most valuable thing we can do is to fly even more because the more that we're flying, the more of a need that the airlines are seeing. And the more that we, you know, if something does go wrong, if a wheelchair is damaged, then, you know, we should be posting that all over social media and it should be going viral every time because the more bad publicity that the airline is getting, I mean, the more they're going to do to try to help us and make things better, I think. So I think the most yeah, important I, thing we can do is to just keep traveling, even though sometimes things go wrong, you know. I, I think there's two parts there, isn't there? I think, yes, you're absolutely right. We all need to travel and I suppose people have to put their health first. Um, of course, that's the most important thing to anybody considering travel is health first. Um, but you're absolutely right. If the if the industry can't see the demand, because they go based on forecasts, you see. Right. And if we're not traveling, that number decreases. And so that can sometimes hamper investment into that space. And I think because of COVID, that's kind of been exacerbated now, where budgets are kind of depleting organizations are maybe not innovating as much or putting as much money into that space um and so we really need as a community to you know get that confidence to travel um but it's difficult right because i understand so I, I totally understand people's nervousness so for oh, yeah. instance um you know Ma Ma martin sibley i saw a post on the accessible travel club um and he's staying in a uh, in a, I think it's some sort of uh, B and B or kind of a cottage somewhere, and he's a. It was advertised as accessible, and he's arrived, and there's a step that he needs to go over to get into the this accommodation, right? And 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 that's exactly a reason as to why people struggle when somebody advertises something as accessible. You only then arrive to find out that it's not. And my frustration here is that the airline industry, right, could do everything perfectly. Right. The airline could be, let's say, you could have a fully accessible toilet, a, you know, wheelchair on board the aircraft. Everything's hunky dory. You then arrive at your uh, attraction or wherever you're staying. You get to the hotel and the bed's not the right height. You can't get a hoist under. And now I'm panicking because now my room's not suitable for my needs after it yeah. being advertised as accessible. So I think the, the whole industry plays a part. You know, you can have 80 percent of a fantastic journey to then have 20% let the whole journey down. And then, the, you know, the whole trip get kind of, in some ways, um, gives a bad perspective to that person and it puts them off traveling. So it's a collective effort. And I think we, we're very quick to judge airlines sometimes. And I think from my perspective, the more I've been involved in industry, actually the challenges that are faced, um, both operationally, logistically, safety, I mean, everything that goes into the industry is very complex. And I think, um, you know, a lot of the changes we want will happen. It's just, I think a lot of people don't always understand some of the complexities in the background that go into making it happen. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. I think we need to continue raising those bad experiences um, and, you know, kind of showing or reminding the industry of those bad experiences, because it's when you leverage that emotion um and you show them exactly what's happening it's like okay we've got to do something now so i think it's a juggling act actually i think it's supporting industry in advisory groups and the community helping the industry improve um and and of course we need to be flying as well um or, or traveling all the time to to give wider feedback as well yeah absolutely i mean the scenario that you described with martin's hotel i saw that in the Accessible Travel Club group and that's just, just, I've dealt with many, many times. And that's why I'm so thankful for Hand Discover to finally be offering truly accessible accommodations. And I'm really excited to work with them and do this Facebook Live and a podcast with them. So uh, companies like Hand Discover I mean, it's, it's really changing the industry. And I would love to give a quick shout out to 
some of our viewers. Um, so Sherry says, good morning. Good morning, Sherry. Uh, Colway good Sport morning. watching, good morning. And Rhonda Jean says, her husband is um, five, six, seven incomplete. We have traveled and leave directions on chair, which we talked about noting the battery type. He has a super pubic, pubic catheter, catheter um, and keep a belt with me backpack that she agrees that the aisle chair is very bad and they don't know how to safely transfer him at all time, which is something we definitely talked about. It's so true, happens all the time. And um, again, there needs to be some sort of consistency throughout the travel industry. Um, Natalie commented and said, sometimes it feels like we are not valued. Um, so that's definitely I think, an occurrence in the, yeah. I think what's interesting about Natalie's comment, and it's something I give a lot of thought about in terms of how we're valued. And actually a lot of that can be cultural, um, at the, you know, the cultural aspects of how different countries um, you know, uh, work with those or assist those with disabilities, for instance. Um, so typically, you know, sort of what I found is Europe in, in some countries are very good and in others, they're very, very bad. Oh, yeah. um, and that could be that again, that, like I said, that could be attitude. Um, it also could be um, pay. So in terms of, you know, what is the job that they're doing in, in a country could be paid very well so it could be seen as kind of a very high skilled job and then in other countries it could be seen as a low skilled job and so the 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 difference in terms of the quality can actually be quite significant and so this where it then comes down to kind of the training again it goes back to consistency how is training around diversity and inclusion being delivered across industry to ensure that regardless of of, of the cultural issues you know the diversity and inclusion is delivered relevant, relevantly and appropriately based on the individuals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, to, I would love to get into your travel experiences. We have about 50. Oh. Minutes, so, uh, what are some of your favorite experiences that you've had while traveling? Oh gosh, so I've been, I mean, the first one that springs to mind, and if my girlfriend's watching, I'm sorry, um, but I, rem I, I remember my first, kiss was snow white in disney wow. uh, in florida i mean that mo i was i was kind of like eight years old and you've got snow white coming to you and she 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 crouches down and i, I i've got a photo and I, my cheeks are so red <laughs> i'm like oh my god i'm kind of in my element i've got snow white giving me a kiss on the cheek i mean <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool um and i think florida is definitely up there with one of my my favorite moments and at the time i was I was more mobile so I could get on and off different rides yeah. um, and it was it, it was brilliant um, and I'd like to go back there actually and, and use you know use the device that we've created to actually get on some of those rides at the theme park that's something I've not yet done and I'd really like I to actually, do that. And I, th I actually used the Able Sling to get on a ride at Disney World like two years ago. So uh, Did you? Oh yeah, that's amazing. Yeah uh, on the Haunted Mansion at Magic Kingdom and we just used Oh what that is sick. <laughs> it made it so much easier so definitely a big help oh, brilliant if only you got me a photo i that would have probably brought a tear to my eye um because, <laughs> I'll do it uh, you know I, it's yeah it's moments like that you can't really put a price on right um it you know it just it, yeah it's just incredible um and i think the the other bit that really um kind of sticks out to me was when i went to lapland in finland um mm -hmm. Again, I went when I was fairly younger. I don't. I see Sana from Finland, you know, doing all of this incredible stuff. Thinking, how the hell is she? Oh my God! Look at look at the timing of that. How did you know that is incredible? So, I mean, Sana is just incredible, and she does amazing stuff over in Finland. And I always remember my time when Nan took me to Lapland, and I saw Santa and the elves, and you know, we were able to go into like these little snow caves and. I mean, it, it was just it was just absolutely phenomenal. And again, that's something that will kind of live with me for the rest of my life. And if people can go to Lapland and experience that both young or as an adult, I mean, it's amazing to do. Um, what else? I've The other thing that I really enjoyed was in Tenerife, we went on a, a bike ride and it was kind of a trike. And um, at the time, I didn't have my sling with me because uh, I hadn't I hadn't come up with the idea at that point, but we used a portable hoist to kind of transfer me in. It was a bit difficult, but we got me in and we rode around on a bike around the whole of the South uh, Island in oh, Tenerife. Nice. Uh, 
and it was i mean it was incredible i mean if you look at the photos you can see me kind of struggling sitting there and my neck was kind of down but that experience of being able to do something that you would never have thought would is, would be, would have been possible and my nan booked it not telling me knowing that if i if i knew that it was going to happen then um i probably wouldn't have gone on it so it's kind of you actually need people to encourage you to do things uh, because often your natural instincts to not do it because you think it's going to be unsafe um and then finally the, the 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 other thing i just want to mention was the caribbean so last year i went sailing around the caribbean in antigua with the jubilee oh, sailing wow. trust um and that was uh, an experience of a lifetime i've i've documented it on youtube it's about a 40 minute video um about kind of you know being on board this kind of tall sailing ship you know sleeping in a bunk with my father nearly falling out of my wheelchair because of the swells um you know eating lobster on princess diana's beach over in uh, anguilla not anguilla sorry uh, barbuda um and it was just the most surreal experience that i could ever imagine um but hey there was four incidences tra traveling by air both arriving and departing arriving and departing i had you know i had a problem at every stage of flying oh. Um, but the point was the, the the trip was absolutely incredible. So yeah, that's four of some of my most kind of highlight moments. Yeah, that those all. What about you, Corey? I mean, Tenerife is somewhere I have looked into going, and re I've not been there, but I'm dying to go to Tenerife. Um, and I mean, I think my favorites have probably the most accessible anyway have been like Barcelona. I think it's an incredibly accessible city. Um, I love it so much um, everything about spain just blows me away and i'm also a big fan of like any kind of unique destination so like india like i never thought it would be accessible but then when i was able to go it just seems to make it so much like better of a trip when you you know spend your whole life thinking like oh, it's not possible it's not going to be accessible and then once you can finally go it just makes it so much better i think yeah, I mean, the, these kind of more exotic places in the world, I always find more challenging to kind of plan a trip. Uh, often, you know, if we're traveling to more, you know, um, uh, popular destinations, say like Barcelona or going to Florida or Tenerife, I think because they're so popular and people are traveling, it's kind of kitted out and it's very easy to kind of plan your trip. Whereas when you're trying to go to these other, you know, exotic areas or those that maybe aren't so accessible, actually planning a trip then becomes far more difficult and it involves far more research and and, and that research takes time oh, yeah. and people that you know don't have particular personal circumstances could just maybe go onto a website put in the dates and the location of where they want to go and it will return the flights you know maybe some car rental hire um, and some accommodation and within a few clicks you can you know book a trip and my what I'm trying to get the industry to do is why can't we do that? Why can't we go onto a search engine, put where we want to go, what date, and it returns us based on our information, what airline's best to fly with, um, you know, what's the best accessible location, uh, or, sorry, hotel or amenities in that area that I wish to stay, allow me to book my whole trip just like that. You know, so let's let's give the community the independence and the ability to plan their own trips easily and quickly like everybody else. Wouldn't that just be really, really nice? Oh, yeah, it that would be incredible. I mean, it would change the whole industry, I think. So, yeah, if you can accomplish yeah. that, that would be incredible for sure. And you've talked a lot about <laughs> um, like your good travel experiences, but are there any that stand out maybe as not so great? And if so, how did you deal with that and overcome it to still have a good trip overall yeah i mean I, I suppose you know when it comes to flying um i've always been fairly fortunate you know i've had things damaged and i've had a foot plate broken my joystick's been bent but i've not i've never had any kind of catastrophic incidences that have kind of destroyed my trip so i think i'm one of the very fortunate ones that you know haven't had any major life-changing traumatic experiences that don't make me want to travel but there have been a couple of instances where you know i used to travel with an old sling and i was lifted up in it and my bottom just fell completely through the sling 
and luckily I was kind of caught, but I could have very easily ended up on the floor um, and it just wasn't appropriate. Um, that was probably about, uh, I don't know, about eight years ago when I was younger. Um, and that experience kind of was quite traumatic in itself. Um, the to Again, the toileting, I always paranoid about toileting. Um, I think one of the things I, I did have actually, <laughs> was, um, it's quite funny, we were in London and we were in a hotel and uh, that we were uh, we were asleep in our hotel room, and uh, it, it was like two thirty in the morning, and um, I was completely stark as in bed, no clothes on, and this fire alarm goes off in the hotel, and I'm like, oh my god, you know, I'm I'm in bed, I need to be hoisted. It takes me like what half an hour to get dressed and get into my chair and be ready, and all of a sudden, after about fifteen minutes of this alarm going off. I've got a guy knocking on my door uh, mm. trying to come in. So my girlfriend, um, at this point, I'm in the hoist. I've got no clothes on trying to get in my chair because this fire <laughs> alarm's going off. <laughs> and this guy, because because we didn't answer the door in time, he just opens the bloody door. Wow. And I'm there in my hoist, completely no <laughs> clothes on. And he's got like a full frontal view. And, and then all of a sudden, two minutes later, another guy turns up and I've got two of them <laughs> just staring at me like that. <laughs> just go full on staring at me and I'm thinking what's going on here and uh, I see the funny side of that but I could imagine there's a lot of people that would either be annoyed because it took them so long to get to the door right. or two because the fact they just kind of came in um, because they didn't get the response because I was in the process of getting in my chair you know transfer and it wasn't a case that we could just answer the door and they just came in and actually I could imagine people would be furious about that as well. And I think the, the, the note to take with that is actually what are hotels doing when it comes to fire evacuation plans? Right. You know, when you arrive at a hotel, are you having an evacuation plan done? If not, you should be. Um, so do request one. Um, and they should obviously be asking you about how, you know, what is your procedure? Can you make your way, you know, independently independently to an evac point or do you need assistance to come to your room so i suppose you know looking at those things is really really important um so yeah i again there hasn't been anything catastrophic for me obviously boarding planes um i hate that i mean there was one time when i was in in paris um and i just you know there was i had to be taken up to baggage claims area on an aisle chair from the aircraft to get my wheelchair yeah. and be lifted from the aisle chair into my chair in baggage claims in front of probably 50 to 100 people collecting their That's stuff to me. and i'm That's thinking actually yeah it's happening yeah, i know it's just it's frustrating corey and i you know i do i i I understand people's challenges and that's kind of why I'm here and why you're doing what you're do, doing is to kind of hopefully try and prevent all of these problems from happening in the future. Yeah, hopefully so. And um, it's funny that you mentioned the fire alarm in the middle of the night because the same exact thing happened to me in uh, Sydney, Australia. So I was in Sydney, it was like 3 a.m. middle of the night and the fire alarm went off and I did get in my wheelchair and made it to um, like the elevator and staircase where everyone was evacuating, that we were on like the 15th floor in the hotel. And so the elevator was not working and everyone on our floor was running down the staircase and like just leaving us, like my mom and I. And um, so we were left there alone and nobody ever came from the hotel. And luckily, like it was a false alarm, so everything was fine. But yeah. none of the staff from the hotel ever came to check on us or anything. And it would have been a real fire. I mean, it would have been awful. And I suppose that the, the, the message to people there is if you have your own sling um, right. that you sit in all the time, you could have it in your chair. So then when you make your way to the evacuation point, often there's evacuation chairs there. But how do you actually get into an evac chair? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the, these things are things we don't think about until these problems arise. And so I think, you know, there's another message there as to why somebody should have their own transferring sling, you know, for that, for, for that exact reason. Oh, yeah. um, exactly. I suppose one of the things that I suppose one of the things I want to mention, Corey, um, is kind of when we look at the, the travel and tourism industry as a whole, it's all about kind of this seamless travel experience 
you know, we need we need better accessibility at airports um, and how we get to airports and the airlines. Then we need to look at accessible locations and amenities. You know, mm. we're seeing some good examples coming out now. Um, and what we need is we need all of these different stakeholders across industry to collaborate together so that this consistency from booking a travel trip to actually undertaking the trip and traveling and experiencing those different services are all consistent. And at yep. the moment, everything is siloed. Um, and what we're also seeing is we're seeing more and more apps being created for people to use. I don't want to be using 10, 20 different apps just to mm -hmm. under undertake a travel trip. Give me one or two max that I need to use that I can undertake all of the different bits that I need in order to take that trip. You know, and it's just getting very frustrating. You know, I don't I don't want an app to find the accessible bus route in London to then use an app to book kind of my hotel or tell me where a, a toilet is. Give it to me in one bloody solution um, or two solutions. But, but yeah, I mean, for those at more active travelers, if you're traveling all the time, you're having to do create loads of different profiles for loads of different airlines or I mean, oh, it's just oh no, it gets me going. So I think, yes, we need to see we need to see that um, siloed approach gone and consistency with a pan travel tourism kind of association that advises globally from a top level to drive best practice um, to, to deliver on consistency, trust and a seamless travel journey experience. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that would be incredible and hopefully we'll see it within the next couple of years. Uh, that would be amazing. Uh, but one final question for you. Um, so once the pandemic is over and everything's kind of back to normal destinations are fully opened up. What is at the top of your bucket list? Do you know, I got asked this yesterday um, mm -hmm. in an interview I was doing yesterday and I mentioned Italy. Um, and I think, I think actually you mentioned it to me before, Bior, I think you're looking at potentially going. And um, yeah, Italy's always struck me. I've always liked the Italian cuisine, the culture, but what strikes me is uh, Italy always comes across as very inaccessible um, and it's kind of put me off traveling to Italy. Um, but I know there's, you know, companies out there that make stuff happen. Um, and so, yeah, Italy is something that I will look at be, you know, looking to go to at some point. And the other place I'd like to go to is, of course, New Zealand, um, Tokyo. And the other place I really want to go and see is Barcelona. Um, again, I've heard a lot of good things about Barcelona. Spanish culture is fantastic. Um, and yeah, so so there's a couple of countries that I'd like to go to. Awesome. Sherry says that's at the top of her bucket list as well. So uh, maybe you guys Brilliant. can meet up there. <laughs> and um, Harry says the EVAC plus chair is an emergency stairway descendant for mobility impaired people. So um, that's one option yeah, I mean, you could also use. Yeah. Like you were saying, the able move sling to be able to transfer into the evacuation chair. Yeah, we're just one example of many out there um, that can be used. I think it for me, it's all about putting your safety as an individual first, regardless of what you have. Um, you know, I've always had that ethos of making sure that we as a community can travel safely, uh, you know, with dignity and comfort, and ultimately. Um, you know, I just want to make sure that we're all traveling in that way. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, where can people find Able Move products online? Can you tell everyone how to purchase a product of their own? Yeah, just simply go to www.ablemove.co.uk uh, and you can take a look around. We're very responsive um, and we're turning around things very, you know, deliveries very quickly at the moment. Um, international travel takes a little bit longer uh, with the challenges, as you know, with Brexit, the UK have detached from Europe, um, yeah. which I was somewhat disappointed about, but never mind, it is what it is. Uh, but no, we're, we're cooking on gas. So yeah, take a look, please. Awesome, absolutely. And uh, I cannot recommend, you know, the Able Move Sling enough, the Easy Travel Seed. It has completely changed my travel experience. And I'm sure anyone watching that, um, you know, needs help with transferring, it could definitely change the game for them as well. So uh, I, I would highly, I, yeah. highly recommend it. 
I, I would encourage, you know, any of you, regardless if it's transfers or not, just to get in touch um, with, you know, me or again, Corey or any of us really, you know, if any concerns, I'm always kind of there happy to help. You know, I believe in the whole, you know, concept of, you know, this seamless travel experience across the travel and tourism sector. And so, you know, I do have quite a bit of lived experience as well. So please do come and give me an idea if you need some wider help as well. Awesome. And thank you so much for talking with me today. It's been a lot of fun. I'm glad we could cover so many topics from air travel oh. to accessible destinations. I feel like we definitely covered a lot. So hopefully it was very helpful to everyone watching. Perfect. I hope so too. Thanks for having me, Hand Discover and Corey. It's been great. And uh, hopefully do it again sometime soon. Yeah, hopefully so. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye, everyone. And thank you all so much for watching. Um, this has been a really great interview and I've enjoyed talking with Josh today. Um, please stay tuned here on the Hand Discover Facebook page because we will be doing another episode of Access All Areas within the next few weeks. So definitely stay tuned for that. And I hope you all have a great rest of the week. See you later.